Hello and welcome to this AIM discussion on JAB code. I am Mike Allen and I serve AIM as their member engagement manager. AIM is the global industry alliance which represents the interest of manufacturers, software vendors, integrators, government, and end users that use technology based on barcoding, RFID, and mobile technology. AIM membership is about supporting standards, community, advocacy, and knowledge. Specifically, you will receive early access to industry technical research and information. Your membership gives you the opportunity to influence the direction of our industry and actively participate in research. Belonging and participating with your peers will return increased credibility for your products, services, and organization. AIM is an investment in your future. Today we have AIM member Sprague Ackley with us to discuss the new JAB code. Sprague is the chair for ISO IEC JTC1 SC31WG1. He is also a fellow at Honeywell Safety and Productivity Solutions. Welcome, Sprague. Hey, Mike. So first, if you could give AIM an overview of WG1. Sure. So WG1, or Workgroup 1, uh, is the technical uh, barcode symbology uh, ISO standard body. It's been around for about 20 years. There's over 100 uh, individual expert contributors from around the world. And we are responsible for the creation and maintenance of all the barcode symbologies and all the barcode print quality uh, specifications in use today. So what is just another barcode project? Jab code, or uh, tongue in cheek, I guess uh, the name, just another barcode, uh, was developed by uh, Fraunhofer Institute in Germany to help with uh, getting biometric data onto identity documents. Uh, of course, biometric data would be something like uh, iris information or fingerprint information, and it's a fairly large amount of data. And they found that using current uh, two-dimensional barcodes, such as data matrix, took up a lot of space on these documents, and they wanted to develop a way of putting the same amount of information into a smaller space. Okay. So why is JAB cutting edge and important? Well, there are many interesting things about JAB code. Of course, the most stunning of which is that it is a, uh, what they call a polychrome symbology. I would just prefer to call, uh, call it a color symbology. And while we uh, have color symbologies uh, in our industry, even some of the very first barcodes used colors back in the 60s, uh, and there were many patents in the 80s and 90s about color symbologies, uh, AIM published the first uh, standardized color symbology a few years ago called UltraCode. And JAB code uh, takes that color technology one step further by allowing uh, more colors to be used and, uh, and several other interesting technical uh, advantages. Uh, in addition, it allows flexibility of format uh, so that JAB code can be configured, uh, you know, for instance, as a frame around uh, uh, a document or in a U shape or, uh, or any type of combination of rectangles pieced together. So the fact that you can put a lot of data in a small space, you're using color, and the format is flexible uh, gives JAB code kind of a unique uh, advantage. So why is it being developed now, and what does this mean for the AIDC industry? Uh, it's developed now because uh, the the Work Group 1 member, uh, National Body of Germany, had this project, uh, as I described, and that's why it's happening now. Uh, there's, of course, a huge amount of uh, emphasis on uh, identity and identity documentation for uh, all kinds of reasons, particularly uh, border crossings and, uh, you know, dealing with the refugee issue, especially in Germany. So I think that's why it's happening now. And uh, this is, I think, important for the AIDC industry because as we 
uh, go more and more to uh, mobile device use and application in our everyday lives and also in our uh, industrial lives, um, the use of color sensors in those devices um, gives us kind of the opportunity to leverage color more than we have in the past. So you mentioned ultra code a little bit earlier. What's the difference between the jab code and ultra code? Well, ultra code has a fixed number of colors and a fixed uh, format, which is rectangular, uh, and uh, and jab code uses more colors, so it can have more information uh, in the, in the same area and has a flexible format so that it can be rectangular or square or U-shaped, as I mentioned before. So those are the two uh, biggest differences. There are also some technical differences in the way that the error correction is uh, formatted and the way the finding algorithms are generated and things like that, but uh, those are the, the two biggest differences. Okay. And is there a quality assessment process uh, like, for instance, printers printing different color reds? That's a very good question, and the answer is uh, essentially uh, we have taken the color measurement process from UltraCode, and that is the starting point for jab code. So the methods developed for UltraCode are being leveraged directly into JAB code, and that's going to be one of the biggest focuses of this project is to make sure that those methods are quantitative and repeatable um, and applicable to the multiple colors that uh, JAB code uh, utilizes. But that, that is a remains-to-be-seen uh, technology at this point. Okay, and my last question for you is, which vertical markets would have the most interest in JAB code? You know, that's a good question. It's come to be uh, based on these identity applications, but uh, there are many other applications that can benefit from putting more information in the, in the same uh, space. And, of course, the fact that it is color gives it possibly some uh, interest in any type of retail type applications or uh, applications that are, um, you know, customer-facing type applications as opposed to purely industrial applications. In fact, uh, I put a few slides together that uh, maybe would give you a better idea of those types of markets, and I was wondering, Mike, if you could uh, pull those up for me. Yeah, let's go through those slides right now. The first slide, which is a, a little bit of a summary of what I went over, but I wanted to show uh, you an example of an identity document. So this might be, uh, you know, from any given country. It might be for crossing borders. It might be for uh, getting government uh, benefits, um, et cetera. So, a typical application uh, for a 2D symbology is, this says uh, 64 bytes, but it's in the order of 100 bytes. And when you have a, uh, you know, a limited amount of space for, in this case, an identity document or for any type of an application, there is, um, you know, a need to put automatic identification into a smaller area. And one of the problems with smaller barcodes that do, do not include uh, biometric information is that you need some type of uh, online uh, verification of that information. So, for instance, if you scan your passport, you know, coming into uh, a, a given country, that information from the passport goes up to an online computer for verification. And it would be nice to have... Uh, identity information contained in the document itself. So I mentioned uh, that it can be in many different uh, formats, and here on the right you can see that there's a, uh, 
a square format, a rectangular format, and a, a U-shaped format. And that is uh, structured based on a series of rectangles that are connected. And so you can have uh, many different uh, uh, rectangle shapes and sizes connected and, for instance, can come up with just about any shape that you want. But typically the idea is uh, that the barcode can fill the empty area on a document uh, as opposed to uh, the, all the information being placed around the barcode. So instead of the barcode being kind of the center of attention, the barcode can be uh, printed, you know, kind of as the background. So the various uh, different colors give you approximately three times the data density. You need a slightly bigger X dimension for the same type of scanning performance, but you have a lot more information in each individual uh, color cell. So the overall result is around 3X. There are a variety of uh, color combinations that can be used, like you can use four colors, you can use eight colors, you can use 16 colors. And although the symbology uh, allows even more than that, that's another aspect of our project is to determine what is a practical limit on the number of colors that can be used. Uh, there is no quiet zone required. The finding algorithms uh, are in internal, and I could show you where the finder patterns are on that square symbol. Uh, they're a little bit, little bit tough to see unless you are, are used to it. Um, but the scanner can pick out the, uh, the corners of the symbol very easily from the inside, and then th there are also structural elements internal to the symbol to allow a scanner to decode them in much the same way that a scanner decodes a data matrix or QR code today. I mentioned the, slate, uh, the uh, shape flexibility and it uses uh, a single symbol that has all of the information in it, and then what they call the slave symbols. Each symbol attached to the master gives information of where the next symbol is. Uh, there are no patents claimed, and as far as anyone uh, knows, on Workgroup 1, uh, all of the technology in here uh, is covered by patents that have long ago expired, and so we believe it is uh, fully in the public domain and uh, or open source code for the encoding uh, and the decoding of this symbol uh, is being made available by the inventors. So you asked about uh, some of the areas in the AIDC world that this could be used. Uh, we talked about uh, biometric data and offline uh, verification, but pretty much any application in which uh, you read the symbol using a smartphone would be uh, an ideal application for this symbology. Typical barcode scanners are just uh, one color and, the, and they're not able to read JAB code, so when you have uh, camera type scanners like in a cell phone, you, you kind of get the color reading for free. And so it might also be useful in applications where, for instance, uh, QR code is used today, which might be, for instance, accessing information on the web. Uh, any type of consumer payment applications, like where you use your smartphone to um, maybe buy things at a cafe or in a, uh, uh, some new types of supermarkets use this type of technology. Uh, and in those kind of cases where you have maybe a small, um, you know, loyalty card, this would allow more information and uh, allow your identity to be confirmed in addition to uh, your loyalty information. Uh, there's also um, any other type of documentation in addition to identity, but related to identity, um, such as, you know, uh, if you need to certify any type of um, 
achievements that you might have uh, in your career, like uh, um, diplomas uh, or uh, various types of educational certifications, um, this would be a good thing to do that because you can include the biometric uh, data in that. So the other great thing about applications when you have something new like this is we're not really sure what applications people are going to come up with. Uh, and whenever I've uh, spoken to people about this new symbology, just the fact that it's color seems to inspire new ideas uh, because it's, to be honest, it, it looks pretty when you're looking at it. And uh, there's just a lot of uh, ideas that pop up when people see something that they've never seen before. So I'm imagining applications that we don't even know about will become uh, common in a few years. So that's, to me, the most exciting thing about this symbology. OK, that's some great information. Uh, thank you for your time today, Sprague. My pleasure. Thank you very much for putting this together, Mike. Have That's a great no day. problem. Uh, if you would like to learn more about this as well as other projects going on in the industry, you can reach out to AIM via email at info at aimglobal.org or give us a call at 724-742-4470. Thank you and have a great day.